It's an honor for me to be here today. So I want to, over the next few minutes, share a little bit of what our lab is uh, developing on real-time uh, biosensor technology. But just to motivate that, um, you know, if you make an observation that for great structures and machines that we have made over uh, last, say, 100 years, we take great care in making sure that our machines are operating properly and that the state of the machines are safe. Um, so for example, for every jet engine, there's more than 30 sensors that are built in. It's constantly monitoring how the engine is doing, and it's linked via satellite to the engine manufacturer that's monitoring the state. And so I feel much more safe um, riding on airplanes after I learned this fact. But if you think about the big picture, for the most important machinery, we do something quite different, in fact, quite crazy. We check once a year if you're diligent, and only when you think there's something wrong with your machinery. <laughs> and I think, in fact, this is one of the main sort of sources why healthcare is so uh, expensive and why we can't catch diseases like cancer and others early. That's really the solution. So we thought, in the future, wouldn't it be amazing if we could continuously measure our state in terms of molecules in vivo, that means inside the body, in real time, just like we do for the airplanes. So why can't we do this now? Well, it's because we don't have sensors that can do this function. And measuring molecules in the body continuously is a very, very difficult uh, engineering challenge. And that's because unlike sort of the laboratory tests that we often do, where they add reagents, then they mix things and exchange buffers. We can't do any of that. And the sensor has to work in a fairly challenging environment like blood and tissue continuously with sort of no external addition of anything. So today, just to give you a calibration of how hard this is, there are only a handful of molecules that you can measure continuously in the body. The two probably most well-known ones are blood oxygen, that's the pulse oximeter that gets clipped onto you when you go to the emergency room. And the other, perhaps the more famous one, is the continuous glucose sensor for diabetes care. The continuous glucose monitoring um, system took about 40 years to develop with about $40 billion of investment. And today, it works for about a week, and you have to replace it. And because it drifts so much, you have to still do a blood precalibration at least once a day. That's the current state of the art. But what's really killer is that because of the specific chemistry that's used, it only works for glucose. You can't use it to measure other biomarkers that signifies your health and disease. So five years ago, we developed a general approach. We've been thinking about this for about a good decade. How do we do this? And five years ago, we published our first work on a general approach for measuring molecules in the body continuously. So I'm going to show you a movie. So there's an animation. <laughs> and what we're doing is we are um, injecting a chemotherapy drug, it's called doxorubicin, that's the green stuff, into um, a live rat. And we're drawing very small amount of blood, about 15 drops of blood per hour. And that goes into our sensor device. And our sensor device, which is a microfluidic device, it's size of a, say, a microscope slide, um, combines multiple technologies to measure the concentration of this chemotherapy drug continuously. So blood is a very sort of sticky, uh, non-Newtonian uh, fluid, and it contains many sticky things that will um, gunk up the sensor. So what we did first is to flow a layer of uh, basically salt water, and we exploit the fact that our drug is a small molecule, so it diffuses much faster and reaches our sensor elements. These are synthetic antibodies that we create in our lab. And they're very special because unlike natural antibodies in your body, these are engineered to bind to our drug and change shape. So it undergoes binding-induced shape change. And what we do at the end of this probe is to put a redox reporter that's doing a redox reaction to the electrode, and we're continuously measuring that current. 
And this electron transfer is very sensitive to distance. It's a quantum mechanical tunneling behavior. And even a fraction of an angstrom will give you a signal. And we measure that continuously uh, at different frequencies to correct for noise and drift, just like your noise-canceling headphones. So by doing this and integrating multiple technologies, we're able to measure this drug. Uh, in a, uh, so this is in human whole blood in vitro. And we're able to measure drug concentrations for the first time in a live rat. And as you can see here, at two and a half hours, for example, we give a bolus injection. And you can continuously track how this drug is just being distributed in the body. And as I've mentioned, we designed this sort of system so that it's a general solution. And by switching just that synthetic antibody, we can now measure other drugs. So the one on the left was a cancer therapy drug. The other is an antibiotic. So now that we had this sort of new tool to measure molecules continuously uh, in a rat, we actually um, wanted to think about how to solve a very important problem. We, in fact, picked this particular drug, doxorubicin, because it has a very narrow therapeutic window, meaning if you give too much, it's toxic to the heart. If you don't give enough, cancer comes back. And dosing just the right amount for each patient has always been a challenge. So what we did is to measure individual pharmacokinetic parameters, meaning how each rat is now processing this drug in real time. And as you can see, even for a very genetically similar cohort of rats, the distribution is all over the place. And you can imagine how hard it must be to develop drugs that will work for a much diverse population like us. So this technology, we realized, can now be used to dose each patient perfectly because now we can measure their pharmacokinetic parameters. Then we realized, wait a minute, we can do much better than this. We now have this amazing tool to measure drugs in real time than what an engineer like how we think about it is. If you have a sensor that's fast enough, then we can create a closed loop feedback system around it. So that's the next thing we did. So this is work of Peter Mage, who was a grad student at the time when he developed this. He's finishing up as a postdoc currently in my lab. And what Peter did was to move to a bigger animal, a New Zealand white rabbit, and made a feedback controller that now controls an infusion pump based on the sensor signal. By doing this, we can now do something truly amazing. We can prescribe what concentration profile we want inside the rabbit through a uh, graphic user interface on a computer and make it happen in real time in a live animal. This is the first time anybody was able to manipulate particular biomolecule inside a live animal in closed loop feedback. And uh, closed loop feedbacks work among different um, rabbits and also across different species. So there are many, many, as you can imagine, applications of this kind of technology. And for delivering drugs, we're particularly interested in using this technology for pediatric cancers, which is incredibly hard to dose for kids. Um, it, also is good when you have external um, perturbations, like drug-drug interactions. Um, and by turning on the closed loop, it'll compensate for all these things, just as a thermostat does when there is, for example, a cold air coming into the room. So um, our system has many biomedical applications beyond um, sort of drug dosing. Currently, we're focusing on two really important areas, two important organs. First is the brain. Um, there are many sort of um, diseases of societal impact, like depression, addiction, and we know very little about how the neuromodulators that sort of affect the state of the brain. In fact, we can only measure dopamine while there is serotonin, norepinephrine, and hundreds of different neuromodulators. We have no way of measuring them in real time. So, our lab is now focusing on figuring out strategies on how to do that. The other organ that's of our sort of um, priority is the pancreas um, to treat diabetes. It's a, a very debilitating disease that's going to be a bigger problem. And as I've mentioned, 
continuous glucose meters have made a big impact. We want to make much better ones. But more importantly, we have no way of measuring insulin and glucagon that actually control the concentration of glucose. So we're figuring out ways how to do that um, with our new techniques. So um, towards that end, we're creating now second generation real-time biosensors. These are prototypes um, that can be inserted into tissues like blood and pancreas that I've, uh, that I've just uh, explained. And we have um, some really early um, work on creating an entire system with integrated circuitry that can communicate to the outside of the body and have a system that can be implanted in the body through ultrasound and RF communication um, circuitry. So in a big picture, what we want to be able to do is really go from sort of this very infrequent measurement of not really understanding what our body's doing um, and measuring once a year to what we're doing really with jet engines and other important machines that we've created, which is to measure the state of the engine and fix things be before it becomes a really big problem. And I'd like to thank our uh, talented research group at our local Mexican restaurant in downtown Palo Alto <laughs> <laughs> and our funding agencies. Thank you very much. <laughs>